Father, we are, again, just grateful uh, to be here, just sitting under the preaching of your word. We're thankful for your word. We're thankful just for the church body, um, just allowing us just opportunities to, to serve within the context of church, uh, both locally and also globally. Uh, we pray now, Lord, that you will uh, first humble my heart, uh, humble us, Lord, um, soften our hearts and our minds to, to your word. Uh, we pray that uh, this passage will, will be piercing to our souls and that we will again just walk away um, thinking about you, uh, the risen Christ. Be with us now. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, years ago, um, I believe it was around the first year of marriage. When I say years ago, it's about eight years ago. Uh, my, my wife and I participated in um, some inner city ministries in San Francisco and involved a ministry within the, the Tenderloin District. It's a very poor community in San Francisco, if not one of the poorest communities uh, in San Francisco. About, there's about a three-mile radius uh, where there's, uh, a lot of, again, there's just a lot of buildings, all the tall buildings, and people living in those buildings. Uh, they're all low-income buildings, most of them. And so uh, what would we do? We'd take a group of uh, college students and we take part of a conference, and then from there we'll get some minor training, and then uh, basically we just do hands-on ministry all day. Uh, I remember uh, going door to door, handing out food, asking people, you know, how could we pray for them? Uh, we did our best to to share the gospel and, and the love of Jesus Christ through this type of hands-on ministry. Uh, we did. We met some pretty interesting people, uh, to say the least. Uh, there would be some who were receptive to the gospel, but there would also be those who would flat out reject us. Um, some, believe it or not, would, would curse at us, uh, even slam the door in our faces. Uh, but for some, but others, uh, for the most part, were thankful for the opportunity to serve uh, in such a, a vital inner city ministry. Uh, and so they, they knew we were coming. Uh, it's just a matter of whether or not they're going to listen to us uh, and maybe we could share the gospel. Uh, but looking back, it really opened my eyes to the brokenness and bondage of those who were going through various types of struggles. There, there were uh, people who were battling addictions to drugs, to alcohol, and all sorts of other things. I mean, some were, were in total bondage, and you could, just, you could just see it. As soon as they opened the door, their, their eyes were all red, right? There's, there's drugs everywhere in the room. And some of them were actually using it as they opened the door. Then there were those who, who truly wanted to be healed. And they would say, look, just, just pray for me. You know, I want to be healed of this addiction. You know, there are those that, that struggled for over 20 to 30 years. They'd be in pain physically and, and in bondage mentally. On the outside, you could, you could, again, you could see and, and sense their pain. And so, you know, as a group, our, our compassion would really overflow for them, knowing that they'd probably remain like this for their entire lives. I remember talking to this one man, and he kept telling us you know, he just wanted out. He didn't want to feel the pain of, of drug addiction. He didn't want to be alone, and he essentially was stuck Yet as, as I would go home and we'd have these debrief sessions, we would think about these people. And I, one thing that just really stuck to me is I would think about their external uh, addictions, but I often wonder how much they were battling on the inside. Our passage today focuses on the leper and his outward condition, and we could plainly read that. We know what's going on here. However, Mark reminds us that throughout his gospel, there is something more important, more pressing than this man's outside condition. What we're really reminded of today is that although we could be hurting on the outside, in addition to the countless millions around the world who are going through, the, through something externally, there is a greater hurt on the inside in which some may not even know about. Therefore, my, my aim or my proposition today is this, Jesus heals the outward condition of a leper, but cares more deeply about the inward condition of man. 
Jesus heals the outward condition of a leopard, as we see here, but cares more deeply about the inward condition of all people. And that takes us to our first point this morning, which I like to call the, the call of the leopard to be made clean. The call of the leper to be made clean. Verse 40, And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. You know, reading this text, I was actually tempted in my first point to use the word cry. The, the cry of the leper. It doesn't say that he cried out to Jesus in the text, but it would most certainly seem like the leper did call out with a sense of urgency. Now, now church family, let, let us think through this together this morning. <clears throat> if you recall, Jesus was casting out demons, right? And now he was preaching in Galilee. And as Rod preached last week, people were seeking him for ultimately healing. And so, Think about this. The encounter with the leper was not a casual one. The leper wasn't just sitting under a tree and suddenly Jesus, and suddenly sees Jesus and calls out for him to healing, right? He wasn't just, you know, waiting alongside the road. It says that he, that he implored Jesus, almost a, a sense of desperation. Not only did the leper call out to Jesus, he dropped to his knees. It says he was kneeling. So the leopard fell on his knees like a beggar, called to Jesus, asking to be healed from this ugly disease. And so in our first point, what I want to focus on right now are three aspects about the leper's condition. Three aspects about the leper's condition. First, we find the leper's physical condition. By definition, leprosy is a skin disease that causes severe disfiguring skin sores and nerve damage in the arms, legs, and skin areas around the body. Some believe that this leper had, had it all over his body. It wasn't just one part. So the physical condition would also affect not only his body, but also just his general outward appearance. In Leviticus 13 and 14, it gives us the Old Testament law regarding those with leprosy. Let me read to you uh, Leviticus 13 verse 45 says this, the leprous person who has the disease shall, war, shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose and he, shall, and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. Now what does this mean? It needed to be clear to everyone who had leprosy, to, uh, to those who had leprosy throughout the community. It needs to be clear who had leprosy because it really separated them. And without question, the leper's condition would make this person easy to spot in any setting. Not only do we see the physical humiliation of the leper, but the social dynamic could, be, could not be any clearer. The leper's social condition is what I like to call our second subpoint here. Now, not, not only were the lepers held unclean, but they were considered unfit for society. Continuing reading in Leviticus, Leviticus 13, Verse 46, it says this, He shall remain unclean as long as he had the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. And for more context, let me read to you Numbers, Numbers chapter 5, just the first couple of verses there. It's, it's the law regarding unclean people. Verse 1, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the people of Israel that they put out of the camp everyone who is leprous or has discharged and everyone who is unclean through contact with the dead. You shall put out both male and female, putting them outside the camp that they may not defile their camp in the midst of which I dwell. And the people of Israel did so and put them outside the camp as the Lord said to Moses. So the people of Israel did. For you call, there's, there was another... Uh, story where Jesus healed the 10 lepers in Luke 17. And Luke indicates that, that they would have to stand at a distance. So again, the leper was isolated from community, his family, his friends, even the general public. And so again, going back to this story, I mean, he wanted to be free from this disease, 
But more than that, he wanted to be free from the shame and the rejection he probably experienced maybe his whole life. I mean, we, we don't know how long he, he was a leper. So he, he experienced physical pain and social separation. He was an outcast in society. However, when, when seeing this physical and social condition, it actually helps us see something much more deeper here. And this is where essentially the text is going to take us this morning. It's what I call his spiritual condition, the leper's spiritual condition. And what I really mean here is man's spiritual condition in connection to the leper. Man's spiritual condition in connection to the leper. When we see a miracle performed by Jesus, we have to understand the deep underlying message behind that miracle. Okay, so as we read, as we go through the book of Mark, there's always, usually, a deep underlying message behind that miracle. So in our story today, we find something, something weightier, as I mentioned, than just a leper being healed. Let me preface this by saying we don't know where the leper stood spiritually, okay? Doesn't, doesn't give us any, any information about that, right? So we could maybe safely assume he was not any worse than any fellow Jew or Gentile from what we know. However, more often than not, what's associated with leprosy is sin. The belief, especially in the Old Testament, was that leprosy was a sign of judgment toward the person. It was considered divine punishment of sins committed against God. Let me give you a few examples that leprosy was a sign of judgment in the Old Testament. Some of us recall maybe Moses or Miriam, Moses' sister, Numbers 12. And Miriam was actually struck or was stricken with leprosy for speaking against Moses when he married a woman from Ethiopia. And then King Uzziah, in 2 Chronicles 26, he, he grew proud and he sinned against God by entering the temple to burn incense. And since something happened, let me, let me read for you 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 19. It says, Then Uzziah was, was angry. Now he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And when he became angry with the priest, leprosy broke out on his forehead in the presence of the priest in the house of the Lord by the altar of incense. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him. And behold, he was leprous in his forehead. And they rushed him out quickly. And he himself hurried to go out because the Lord had struck him. Verse 21, and King Uzziah was a leper to the day of his death. The leper was considered unclean physically, but also leprosy was also a sign of being unclean spiritually. One commentary put it this way. When you read the tests for leprosy in Leviticus 13, you can see how the disease is a picture of sin. Like sin, leprosy is deeper than the skin. It spreads, it defiles and isolates, and it renders things fit only for the fire. Anyone who has never trusted the Savior spiritually in worse shape than this man was physically. Now going back to our story this morning, again, it doesn't say how long this person had leprosy, but again, I, I want us to imagine maybe all, maybe all your life you've been struck with this disease. You've been in pain and misery for some time. But you hear about this person named Jesus who, who was healing many. He was casting out demons. He was, he was, um, people from everywhere were, were looking for him, and he was preaching this so-called gospel. So this leper heard about this man, Jesus, while in isolation, and Basically, that, that gave him the courage to come from the outskirts of society and break through the crowds, having to yell, unclean, unclean, like the law indicated, while casting himself at the feet of Jesus, yearning to be healed. Now, thinking through this story, it's, it's a remarkable thing, and, and, and that's why my Mark, Matthew, and also Luke all had similar accounts of this same exact story. And so there's something, again, much more deeper that we're, we're going to get to in a little bit. But let me point to one more thing, and it's a leper's words. He says this, 
at the end of the verse, if you will, you can make me clean. The leper's words could not be any more humbling. Luke's account describes the leper as referring to him as Lord. Referring to Jesus as Lord. Yet he comes to Jesus on his knees and he says, if you will, Lord, make me clean. And so what we find here is he broke all the guidelines of society to get to Jesus. And the question was not whether Jesus could heal him, but would he? Therefore, we could only assume that the leper approached Jesus with great courage, great humility, and great faith. Let me ask you something. In your brokenness, how do you approach Jesus? Do you exercise great courage, great humility, and great faith? Let me remind you that if we approach Jesus with the same courage, humility, and faith, we we'll begin to see ourselves in a different light. But more so, we we'll begin to see Jesus differently as well. Which takes us to our second point. As we've witnessed the leper's call, we now see Jesus' reaction. It's what I call the compassion of Jesus over the unclean. The compassion of Jesus over the unclean. Verse 41, moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. You know, as we're going through the book of Mark, sometimes it's good to remind ourselves that Jesus did not come to be just some sin-slaying machine. I mean, we could read through the Gospels and become so mechanical about Jesus, right? I mean, he came here, he did his job, and then boom, he's gone. In other words, we could become very robotic in the way we approach Mark. And it moves so fast. He went there, he healed them, he saved them, and that's it. But l let us pause here. We're just going to sit here, and we're just going to think about Jesus' reaction because it tells us something very different about himself. And what we find here are three views of Jesus, three views of Jesus. The first thing is the heart of Jesus, the heart of Jesus. It says he was moved with pity. Mark is the only gospel that records this type of response from Jesus, where he mentioned that he was moved with pity. And what we find here is, is no ordinary response. It was different. More so, this was a, an emotional response from a Savior who actually cares. It wasn't just an intellectual response, but it was, it was a heart reaction. One commentary says it was a gut-wrenching compassion that Jesus was showing. A gut-wrenching compassion that Jesus was showing. You know that feeling when, when you see a loved one going through physical pain? It's like that. I remember, I remember when... When I was 20, I, my, my brother was hospitalized, and you know, I, it's for, I've never seen my brother. He, he's older than me. I've never seen him um, just unhealthy or, or in any way, but just seeing him in, in a hospital bed, just walking in into the doors, all of a sudden your stomach turns, and there's this gut-wrenching response. And so that's sort of the sick feeling that, that Jesus was, was feeling at that moment. Jesus was moved with compassion. And so we see his heart in this text. Question is, how do we know he was moved with compassion? His next move says it all, which I label the touch of Jesus. The touch of Jesus. It says he stretched out his hand and he touched him. You know, Jesus, Jesus could have healed the leper with just words, with just his words, as we've seen so often throughout his time here on earth. But this, this is huge, and let me tell you why. According to Old Testament law, to touch a leper would make that person unclean. That's why they were separated from everyone. It would only be the priest that could examine the leper okay, and diagnose one as, in un, as unclean or clean. So the priest had the diagnosis, but the healing was a task of a prophet. And... Some of us may know the prophet Elisha 
was one of the prophets that healed a leper. Let me, in 2 Kings 5, there's a story of, of Naaman. Uh, Naaman was, was asking to be healed from leprosy, and although Elisha did not speak to him directly, he gave instructions on how to be healed. Eventually, Naaman obeyed Elisha's instructions, and he was completely healed of leprosy. Now, now here, here's the breakthrough, okay? If the diagnosis could only be done by the priest and healing done by the prophet, Jesus really assumed the role of priest and prophet by touching the leper. He diagnosed him, he saw him, and he healed him, and he touched him by, he, by touching him. The moment Jesus reaches out to touch the leper, he breaks through the physical, the social, the spiritual separation of that day. Rather than contaminating Jesus, the leper was clean. And only Jesus could do that. Only the unblemished, perfect son of God, clean to unclean, could break through the cultural norm. And so his touch spoke volumes, but we also find that his words touched the heart ever so deeply, which I call the words of Jesus. So we see Jesus' heart, we see him touch him. Lastly, he says these words. He says, I will be clean. Now we don't understand these words, I will, unless, unless we go a little deeper. Jesus was saying, I desire, I am more than willing to cleanse you from this awful disease. Some would say that he was, he was delighted in healing this man. Right? His actions were so humanly real that he desired with delight to make this man clean. In verse 42, we find that immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. So, so now the skin sores and nerve damage in the arms, legs, and skin areas around the body are now gone. And so we see this magnific that magnificent uh, scene in just kind of unfold right before our eyes. And we find that Jesus would heal the external disease of this man. Now think about this, church. If this man's outward condition led Jesus to show a heartfelt compassion, how much more does Jesus understand our inward uncleanliness? You see, the leper being clean is not the main point nor is he the main character of the story. From the beginning of Mark, the mission for Jesus was to seek and save those who are lost spiritually. Therefore, he sees our distressed souls and he says, I know you, I understand you, I love you. My heart, my touch, and my words will eventually be demonstrated on the cross. And he will eventually save us from the disease of our own sin. Our third and final point this morning is this, which I find is the command of Jesus to obey. The command of Jesus to obey. Verse 43, and Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. What we find here is the fulfillment to obey the Old Testament law that's found in Leviticus 14. It's what I call the warning to obey Jesus' Jesus's command. The warning to obey Jesus' command. Let me read to you Levit Leviticus 14, starting with verse 2. It says, This shall be the law of the leprous person for the day of his cleansing, and he shall be brought to the priest. And the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall look. Verse 8. And he who is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes, and shave off his hair, and bathe himself in water. And he shall be clean. And after that, he may come into the camp. So why such a stern charge to the leper to go to the priest? Well, let's look back through chapter 1 of Mark. Remember, the whole purpose of Jesus' mission was to seek and save the lost. Verse 38 in Mark. He said to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. 
The main ministry on earth for Jesus was not miracle worker. Yet as he was performing all these miracles and the crowds were getting bigger, demons were being cast out, people were being healed, including the leper. But really, Jesus was there to preach the good news. And that was Mark's point. Jesus did not want any more attention than he already had. He did not want people to come to him for what he could do for them. Listen, but he wanted people to come to him to get him. Let me say that again. He did not want people to come to him for what he could do for them, but he wanted people to come to him to get him. Jesus knew the law and therefore wanted the leper to follow the law. The mission, his mission, still needed to be completed. He was not ready to be the crowned messianic king. That moment will come. And so what we find here is the opposite. Is the leopard does not listen. And so we find the consequence. The consequence for breaking Jesus' command. Verse 45 but he went, out, he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town but was out in desolate places and people were coming to him from every quarter. Well, just, just a side note, we, we don't know if the leper actually obeyed in the end, but it doesn't say, right? But what we do know is the tables now have turned. All of a sudden, the scene concludes with both, Je- with both Jesus and the leper trading places. The leper is now declared clean and, and is on the, in, on, on the inside, so to speak. But Jesus, on the other hand, is alone. The text says he could no longer openly enter a town but was out in desolate places. Jesus would now be the outcast in society And the leper is now inside the community. Now what we have here really is just a a brief picture of what we like to call substitutionary atonement. Jesus, the perfect lamb, took our place as imperfect sinners to be sin on our behalf. The leper, being on the outside covered with with imperfections, was a walking dead man before he met Jesus. Yet Jesus, filled with compassion, healed him and declared him clean. And in doing so, again, he became isolated from it all. The leper did not suffer the consequence. Jesus did. What a wonderful Savior we have before us. Now, allow me to to close this morning with some thoughts. You know, we... We didn't do this on purpose to have Compassion Sunday uh, today. I mean, Rod just gives me the passage and he's like, here, preach this on the 21st. And um, we just happen to be Compassion Sunday. And so, you know, as, as just, this text was, was just so brief. Let, let us think, think through Compassion Sunday and end this text together. And so I wanted to just encourage us uh, to really reflect on three concluding thoughts. If you could turn with me to Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. You came to church today. You heard about Amos. Now Mark. Now we're going to go through Ephesians. So you get a little bonus this morning. Ephesians 2. Three reflections I want us to go through. And that I want us to think about The first is our brokenness. And the question is, do we see ourselves as unclean? The Bible says we're all sinners, that none is righteous, no, not even one. In fact, Ephesians 2 says that we were walking dead people before Jesus saved us, just like the leper starting with verse 1 in Ephesians 2. Follow me. It says that we were, 
dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now, now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the, and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Friends, we were not merely sick, but dead people following the prince of this world, Satan. This is where we confess as dead people that we are unclean. But it gets better. And so our second concluding thought is to reflect really on our Savior. And the question is, do we see Jesus for who he is, not for what he does? Follow along with me. In verse 4 of Ephesians 2, this is the good news. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. By Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we who were once dead are now made alive together with Christ. Do we see this here? He took our place on the outside so that we can now be seated with him on the inside in the heavenly places. And this grace is all a gift from God. Jesus is saying, I saw your ugliness, your brokenness, your pain, your torment. I saw your internal leprosy. I mean, do we see the picture here, church? Jesus, filled with compassion, reached out and touched our mangled hearts and corrupted minds and says, you are mine. And now we could rightfully say, I am no longer unclean, but I am clean. I am clean. Our last reflection, and that is for broken people. Do we have compassion toward others? Do we have compassion toward others? Church family, we have, we have received the greatest gift that anyone could give us, yet our duty is to do good works that is fueled by the gospel. Ephesians 2 verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In being saved by Jesus, our duty and delight should be to show the same compassion toward others. So whatever God is calling you to have compassion on others, maybe it's through maybe adopting a child or supporting a child, maybe it is through adoption, Maybe it's through just supporting some missionary organization or supporting our friends in Bolivia and or Ukraine. Let us help with the external conditions of society, but have Jesus cure the internal hearts of all people. Let us pray. Father, this really brief text should open our eyes to how broken we are internally. Sometimes it is a, a sad but good reminder that you've called us from death to life. And Lord, let us not be so mechanical about that as we go through the book of Mark. And as we see Jesus, our Savior, heal many, but go on to, to complete the mission on the cross where he died for our sins and he rose again on the third day so that we could worship him forever and ever. Lord, only you could stir the compassion in our hearts for other people. And so we, it is a duty. You called us to that duty, but not, not a legalistic duty, but a loving duty. You have given us so many resources, Father, just as, as a body, I pray that we are able to just to give back, no matter how little it is. 
Father, we're just thankful that we have this opportunity to hear your gospel, to hear your word. Be with us this morning and for the rest of the week. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.